a series called Spring Training. Can you shout back at me, Spring Training? Spring training. Um, we're looking at Matthew chapter 10. We're kind of going verse by verse through Matthew chapter 10. And we're looking into a moment where Jesus is literally training and coaching his disciples before he sends them out into the world. He sits them down and he kind of gives them a lecture, like a dissertation, if you will. And he's coaching them and he's teaching them and he's training them before they're sent into the world to preach the kingdom of heaven. And so I just think, man, this is, we need to get ready for a harvest. Come on, somebody. We need to get ready for people that are coming to Jesus. And so one of the most important things we can do is get trained in the word. So this is the week number three. And so we are in um, kind of this training ground moment at the gathering. Has it been good? Yeah. Has, come on. Anybody like, you ready for more? Anybody ready for the word? I'm excited. Hey, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 10, verse 26 through 33. Matthew chapter 10, verse 26 through 33. This mic is kind of hot. If we could uh, fix that, that'd be awesome. Matthew chapter 10, verse 26 through 33. Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, so have no fear. Someone say no fear. Okay. Have no fear of them. And, and by the way, when he says them, he's talking about people that will persecute you. If, if we read this in context, last week, Miles preached. Come on, Miles gave a message last week. And we heard that we ought to kind of expect a level of persecution. You know, how encouraging is that? Like, thank you, Jesus. We're going to be persecuted. Great. That's amazing. But Jesus is talking about them, and he says, those who are going to, you know, hurt you. He says, don't have any fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed. Nothing's hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Some versions say rooftops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Come on, it's getting real. Are, you, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the Father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. Someone say fear not. Fear not. Therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. It's true. It's powerful. It's good. We need it, and we're desperate for the words of God. So, Lord, just get me out of the way, and I pray that you would come and speak and do what you do in this building. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, church? Amen. Come on, shout amen. amen. Anybody ready for a word? Come on. In my younger years, I was, um, I was always strapped with an inhaler because your boy was asthmatic, all right? I, was, uh, I wasn't just charismatic, I was asthmatic. And um, anybody else, you're, you, were, you, you, like, you were strapped with an inhaler. Like, anybody know what a nebulizer is, okay, in the building? Uh, if it, I, was, I was always had an inhaler in my surroundings, and if it got real bad, your boy was on the nebulizer machine, which just helped pump uh, air into my lungs, basically, and clean me out. And so I was, I was an asthmatic as a child. But what would make my asthma worse is the fact that I'm also allergic to dogs. I'm allergic to dogs, cats, horses, bunnies, air, water, grass. I'm kidding. But, but I'm allergic to a whole lot of stuff. Basically, anything with fur, I'm allergic to that. And um, so if I was younger, what would happen is a dog would like, you know, brush past me or like you're like lick my hand or something. And and um, I would just break out in hives, y'all. Like it was nasty. My whole body would be covered in hives. And, and by the way, if you are a dog owner, I, I relate to you not a single bit because I am allergic to dogs and I am absolutely clearly not a dog lover if I could just be so honest. So do what you will. Judge me if you'd like. We're not on the same wavelength, okay? You know, but by the way, while we're on the topic, can I just be honest? If you're someone that lets a dog lick your face, that's disgusting. That's absolutely disgusting. 
Because that tongue has been in places that you know not of, and then you're letting it lick your face. I will leave it there, okay? I will go no further. It's disgusting, so just fix that. For the love of God, fix it, all right? Um, and so either way, I bring this up to say, like, if a dog would come near me, I would get hives all over my body, but it would also, like, hike up my asthma. So I would, I would have hives, but then I would have, like, asthma attacks as a result of being around dogs. And so I, I just remember one night, never forget this night, um, I was, it was probably 2, 3 in the morning. I think I was 9 or 10 years old. And I wake up in the middle of the night, and I cannot breathe for the life of me. This, this literally, it felt like there was no oxygen in my lungs. And I'm <gasps> just couldn't, couldn't breathe, full-on asthma attack. I was anxious. I was afraid. I was like, what in the world is happening? I don't know why this is happening, but I could not breathe. I, I found the, just the ability to walk to my parents' bedroom, and I stumbled into their room enough made enough noise for them to wake up to see me and to see the condition that I was in. Couldn't breathe, <gasps> couldn't, couldn't talk, and no oxygen getting in my lungs. So thank God we live about uh, a mile away from Jordan Hospital. My dad grabbed it with his arms. He threw me in the car. We rushed to the hospital. We get to the hospital, and they throw me on, an, on a nebulizer machine. Clearly it was high-powered high because your boy was saved, I was okay, and I'm here to tell the story, okay? You can clap for that. You absolutely can clap if you want. Imagine with me for a second if as I'm suffocating and as oxygen is not getting into my lungs and as I'm in this condition, my parents looked at me in this moment and were like, were like ah, you know, it is what it is. Like imagine if they saw me in this condition, and they were just distracted. They were like, oh, I mean, you know, we're, we're just busy right now, hon. You know, imagine, or, or if they were just fearful, like they just didn't know what to do. They, they were just afraid of doing anything, so they didn't do anything. Imagine that, that would be hateful, right? That would be, that would be evil. That would be, that would be like sinister to do that to their own son. So thank God that didn't happen. But what about the generation that we live in? that is spiritually suffocating, that is not getting the oxygen and the hope and, and doesn't know the grace and the love and the truth about who Jesus is and what he can do in their life. Can I tell you, friend, this generation is spiritually suffocating. I mean, you know, Generation Z is known as would be called post-Christian, meaning they, they, the, the biblical illiteracy rate in this generation is absurd. It is high. It is staggering. And this generation doesn't know the Bible, never mind knows what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he came to do for their soul to enter heaven. And so the answer is, what, what is our response? If a generation is spiritually suffocating, what is our response? In fact, the, the, the message, and I, and I don't come from a, a, a place or a spirit or a posture of like condemning anybody or judging anybody tonight, but I want to talk about this subject because I think this is exactly what Jesus is doing. And we need to talk about this. Why Christians don't share their faith? Why Christians don't share their faith? You, you know, I think there's three main reasons. And, and just even before I dive into those, I don't know if this is absolutely 100% positively verified, but what I've heard in, in my own research, I, I've heard and I've seen that 93% of Christians do not share, actively share their faith with people meaning 3% of us who believe in Jesus are active in pursuing people and sharing our faith. 93% don't actively pursue people or share their faith with their peers, their friends, their loved ones around them. They don't share their faith. And I think there's, I know there's three reasons why Christians don't share their faith. There's one that's emphasized that we're gonna spend tonight talking about, but there's three to be mentioned. The first one is this, some people just don't care. Like some, some people just don't, they just don't care enough. And honestly, if this is the category you find yourself in, I just, it is what it is. I don't really, I don't really care. Like your heart isn't set on fire to reach people. You don't have an unction or an urgency or a passion to talk about Jesus with anyone. If that's, if that's you and you just don't 
care and you're self-aware and self-admitted enough to say, I just don't really care. If that's you, I would just simply question whether you actually know Jesus for real. And if you're actually aware of the spiritual realities around us, of heaven and hell, of light and darkness. Because once we know Jesus, I'm not talking about just subscribing to Christianity, by the way. Like as if it's just another like YouTube channel that you subscribe to. You know, you know, hit the bell. You know, click the subscribe button. Stay tuned. You know, it's just Christianity is just um, a preference on your list of preference. Like you like rock and roll music, you like Doritos, and you like Christianity. You know, I think that's interesting. If that's you, honestly, maybe the, that's probably why you don't care about the fact that people are spiritually suffocating and dying without the knowledge of Jesus. And my hope tonight, my prayer for you tonight is that you would be quickened and awakened by the Holy Spirit. You would have an encounter with Jesus that you would really know him. And as a result of that, you would have a passion for people that don't know him. First one is we just don't care. Second one is we're just distracted. You know, we just get so caught up with life and careers and a job and a guy and a girl and a husband and a wife and, and all the, the worries and concerns and money and all the things of life, material objects. I need the house. I need the car. I need this and that and all these things. The pressures of life are actually pulling us away and distracting us from what matters the most. We're just distracted. I mean, we just don't have time. We just don't find time, you know, to take someone out for coffee and invest in them and, and share your story with them. We just don't have time. I, if I had a dollar for the amount of times I, I, I hear someone say, oh, I'm so busy, I would be a billionaire at this moment. Oh, I'm just so busy. I'm just so busy. And sometimes like, you don't even have kids, bro. Like, you know, like wait till you have kids. Oh, my goodness. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and I'm just so busy. Yeah, how you doing? Oh, I'm busy. Oh, like anything good happening? Oh, yeah, I'm just so busy. It's like, oh, my goodness. Can we, by the way, can we just stop saying that so often? That is a pet peeve of mine at the gathering. Can we just be a community committed to being like, you know what? I'm not too busy for you. I'm not too busy for the people in my community. I'm not too busy to be with Jesus. I'm not too busy to pray for people at 6.30 on Wednesday night before the service starts. I'm not too busy to show up on Wednesday. I'm not too busy to invite someone to church. I'm not too busy to meet with someone that doesn't know Christ to tell them about what Christ has done in my life. I'm not too busy. You're not, you're not too busy. Come on. I know I'm putting my coach hat on tonight. You know, give me the whistle. You know what I mean? It's spring training, Okay. But, but you're not too busy. But, you, but we believe this idea that oh, I'm just too busy. And really, it's just a distraction. And thirdly is this, the most important, probably the most emphasized one, maybe you are here in this one, is that we don't share our faith because we're simply afraid. We're afraid of what people think of us. We're afraid of how we might come across. We're afraid of judgment. We're afraid of... You know, not having the right answer, not ha saying the right things. We're, we're just afraid of what people might say, what people might do, what, might, what, what they might think. How, how am I going to see it? How? And we're just terrified and afraid. And so we actually keep our mouths shut and don't open up and tell people about Jesus and the hope that you have and the grace that you know and the relationship that you have and the salvation you've experienced and the freedom that you have because we're locked up and paralyzed in this place of fear. We're afraid. In fact, that is a self-purported uh, research that has been done that to, by Christians and from Christians that have said, yeah, I'm just too afraid to share my faith. And Jesus, in this text that we just read, Matthew chapter 10, he says three times. He says three times in just a short amount of verses, do not fear. I want you to shout, do not fear. He says three times, do not fear. He says this to his disciples before he sends and launches them out to do ministry. He says, hey, don't fear. In fact, I love this moment because I'm thinking about all of you. And I'm thinking about me. And, and like, where do we go from here? Like, I think we've confused some things. We think in Christianity the meeting on Wednesday or the meeting on Sunday is like the, is the Super Bowl game. 
Like it is what's the most important thing. But I think that we've actually missed it. I think this moment is the, the locker room chat. But out there is the game. Because out there is what, where people need to know and are desperate for Jesus out there. Not that they don't come in here, but this is more like the locker room. This is where we have these conversations, just like Jesus had this conversation 2,000 years ago with 12 guys who he's about to send out. And you're about to be sent out in just about thir- three hours from now. I'm kidding. I'm not going to preach that long. But like some of you are like, oh, God, sweat drop down. You're like, oh, really? Oh, dear Lord. But I'm, we're about to send you out. And, and Jesus is saying, do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. The first thing he says is really interesting. If we could take a look at it together. He says something like this, and this is my first thought tonight. What I tell you, shout from the rooftops. What I tell you, shout from the rooftops. Don't you love that picture? What I tell you, shout from the rooftops. Matthew chapter 10, verse 26 through 27, he says, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed. Ooh. Nothing's hidden that will not be made known. What? Anybody else? Like, what? What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Honestly, what is Jesus saying? Like this first part, he's like, hey, what's hidden is going to be made known. What's concealed will be revealed. (laughs) I think we read this verse, and so often I hear this verse quoted completely out of context. And in fact, I remember, it's so funny, it scarred me. I remember this moment being in my friend's minivan, okay? His mom is driving, and they were discussing the other son that was not in the car. And they're talking about this, their their son, they're talking about this guy's talking about his brother, my friend. And there, this guy had, had been rebellious, and he, he was not, you know, moral or walking with the Lord by any means. And so they're talking about this. And the mom quotes this verse out of context. And she says, you know, Jesus says, everything he's doing, all of the sin that he's doing, God's going to tell me about. It's going to be revealed. It's going to be uncovered. And I was sitting there as I think I was probably 13, 12 or 13 years old. And I'm like, What? Wait, so God tells every parent what every kid does when they don't know? And like, I'm sweating profusely at this point. I'm like, no, Lord, don't tell my parents for the love of God. Don't tell my parents. I remember freaking out at this moment. It literally scarred me because I'm like, that's crazy. God's going to reveal everything I've ever done. And here's the reality that's in the mix is God knows everything that we do. He, he's not blind to any moment or anything that you've ever done. He sees it all. And isn't it amazing that although he sees it, he still loves you. Although he sees it, he's still like, yep, son, you're my daughter. I love you. I know I still chose you. I'm grateful. I don't know about you, but I'm pumped about that. The fact that God saw every mistake, every error, every wrong, every failure, every sin, everything that I did that was nasty and filthy and sinful. And God looked at that spiritual condition of my life and he said, I still love you. I still, it's not even that I love, I, just, I want you, and I've chosen you, and you're mine. So that reality is at play here, but that's not what I'm talking about. This, this mom, in this moment, what, what scared me and scarred me because she took this verse out of context. She was saying that, hey, God, every little secret sin that you've ever done is going to be made known to the world. Somebody shout Amen. It's like everyone's like, no, I don't think I will shout amen. (laughs) Because it's taken out of context. Jesus, in this context, he's not talking about secret sin. He's talking about preaching the gospel. He's talking about the mystery of the gospel going out, and he's saying, I want you guys to shout it from the rooftops. This is essentially what Jesus is saying. And in fact, Paul, the apostle, refers to this in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. He says, this mystery that the Gentiles are fellow, this mystery is that, the mystery of the gospel, is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members 
of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. You, if you are not Jewish in this room, you are called a Gentile. And the fact that the gospel has reached the entire world, if it has reached you, it has reached the world, and the gospel is for all people, that's the mystery that Paul's talking about and that Jesus is referring to. He's talking about this mystery, the thing that's been concealed, the thing that's been hidden for this short time is the fact that Jesus is Lord and Savior and Messiah, and he can save the world. That's the mystery. And this is what he essentially means. Who I am and what I'm doing, it's not yet fully revealed to the world, but in the right time, at the right moment, it will be, and I'm going to use you guys to talk about it. And I think Jesus is saying the same thing to us. The fact that the gospel is all over the world. Two billion people on planet Earth are Christians. The gospel is powerful. It is the power of God for salvation. I'm unashamed because it's the power of God for salvation, Paul says. And God's saying, I want you to shout it from the rooftops. I'm going to use you guys, average, normal, everyday people. I'm going to use you. Yup. You. Me? Yup. You. I'm going to use you to be the messenger of this gospel. He starts out by saying, hey, don't fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. This thing that's hidden right now, oh, man, it's going to be made known. It will be revealed to the whole world. He says, what I tell you in dark, and he's not talking about, you know, darkness like spiritually. He's saying, hey, what I say to you in the privacy of an, of an evening hour, I want you to take that private thing I've told you, and I want you to go public with it. He says, hey, what, what's, what, what you hear whispered in your ear from me, I want you to stand on a rooftop, and I want you to shout out the gospel message for all to hear. In this ancient context, rooftops were literally used as like a makeshift stage. And that's kind of cool, right? The, the, the Jewish uh, homes had a flat roof on the top. They would stand on that flat roof, and it made a perfect stage for all the people who were walking by, and, and people would preach. And so Jesus said, I want you to get on the stage that is your house, and I want you to tell people what I've told you. Can I just, a little caveat here, this is totally free. Um, discipleship is essentially teaching people what Jesus has taught you. That's it. It's teaching other people what Jesus is teaching you. That's it. That's it. That's it. And Jesus saying, hey, when I whisper in your ear, I want you to shout from the rooftop the love that you have that I told you. I want you to tell the world about that love. The salvation that I gave you. Remember that? I want the whole world to know about that. Make sense? So don't fear. Touch your neighbor and say, don't fear, don't fear, don't fear. He's saying, I want you to get on the stage, and I want you to tell people about this truth. Hey, what is your stage, though? Hey, what is your stage? Like he's saying, hey, get on a, on a rooftop. I think he literally, he meant this literally. Get on a rooftop. But he also meant it metaphorically, meaning, what is your stage? What stage can you go on? What platform do you have? And Jesus is saying, I want you to use that platform and that stage that I've given you for the gospel. Social media, use it for the gospel. TikTok, use it for the gospel. Your, 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 your friends that you have at school, at college, use it. tell those friends about the gospel. I'm not talking about being like weird and in critical and judgmental and, and just intimidating. I'm not talking about that. But hey, take a friend out for coffee and share your story with them. What is your stage? And I want you to use that stage for the gospel. Second thing Jesus says in, is, is in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 through 30. Can we go there? Anybody still with me? Wave at me if you're still with me. Are we, wow, okay, oh, that's amazing. Okay, Matthew chapter 10, that's encouraging. Uh, verse 28 through 30. And do not fear, someone say do not fear. No, Those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Who's he talking about? Himself. 
He's talking about the Lord. He's talking about himself. He's saying, don't fear people. The best they can do is kill you. It's like, wow, um, um, thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord, thank you. Great advice. He said, hey, the best, thing, the be, the, the best they can do is, is take you out. But he's saying, don't fear that. Don't even fear death. He said, fear the one who has authority over both of your, your soul and, and, and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. I always found this little illustration Jesus chooses to use about sparrows really, like, interesting. He even goes on to say, he's like, he's like hey, um, you know the sparrows are sold for two pennies? Hey, like, the father, he sees them when they fall. Like, the father even cares about them. Like, God the father, he cares about the sparrows. And then Jesus is like, hey, you know, if that didn't encourage you, that God cares about the sparrows. He said, hey, um, you're more valuable than a lot of sparrows. It's like, oh, Jesus, um, that's incredibly encouraging. You yeah, know, you're more valuable than even a lot of birds. You, you are more valuable. It's like, oh, th- um, th- that's, mm, that's awesome. Thanks, Jesus. I must be really important to you. I'm, I'm more important than, than birds. That's awesome. Super encouraging. I'm going to take that one. Thank you. So, take that to the bank. Thank you, man. You know, I'm better than some birds. There's, that should have been the title, Better Than Birds. Um, but Jesus is saying this. He, he's, he's making a point. He's like, hey, my father, he notices, he sees every single sparrow. He cares about them. He feeds them. He nurtures them. He protects them. He makes sure they're fed. And when they fall, he notices that. He cares about that. And Jesus is saying, how much more? How much more do I care about you? Like, if I, care, if, if I can know about every single sparrow that falls to the ground, I care about you so much and so deeply and so profoundly. I care about you. I care about you. So, so he says, goes on to say, hey, don't, don't fear people who can take your body. And he's saying this to the disciples because he's kind of giving them a precursor if, it's, if we're just honest. These disciples, these apostles are about to be sent out to preach the gospel, and they will be killed for having this faith and sharing this faith and preaching in the name of Jesus. They will be killed. So he's actually being prophetic here, and he's saying, don't be afraid when your body's on, when you're you're about to die, don't be afraid. Because they don't have authority over your soul. I do. So he's saying this, hey, make sure that who you fear is in the right order. Make sure that who you fear is, is correctly aligned. And he says, if I can just say this to you, what you fear most is what you will follow most. What you fear is what you will follow. And so if you are afraid of what people think about you, what they'll say about, say about you, how many likes you can get, how many shares you can get, if that's your fear, meaning if that's what you are raptured in, in, in thinking about all the time, consistently thinking, man, I just have to approve, I have to get approved by people, I have to appease people, I gotta be okay with people, people have to like me, people have to think greatly of me. He's saying, you've got your, your priorities and your arrangements of who you fear out of whack. And if that's the case, if you fear people, you fear man, you will only ever follow man. I hear this all the time. I'm just like afraid of what, you know, what people will think about me. You know, if I share my faith, if I witness to someone, I'm afraid of what they'll think about. I'm I'm afraid of what, like, I won't be able to answer the questions that they have of me. I'm afraid that I'll look stupid. If I lift my hands in worship, I'm afraid that people will be like, yo, who is that guy? If I, if I, do anything that requires faith. If I start a business that I feel the Lord leading me, if I do these things, I'm afraid of what people think about me. Do you understand something? You are being completely led by people, but not by God. And it is possible, my friends, please hear me. It is possible to live your entire existence on on earth in the fear of man, but not actually do what God has called you and asked you to do. It's a hard truth, but who you fear is who you'll follow. I'm just afraid of what they'll think about me. By the way, can I just like pause and just say like, if you, you're giving yourself, if you're someone, you're afraid of what people think about you, you're giving yourself way too much credit. Because if you're afraid of what people think about you, you're actually assuming that people think about you often. 
And you're assuming that people think about you often is actually a false assumption because people think about themselves often. And then are often thinking about you. Let's, can we be real? So you're giving yourself actually too much credit, my friend. All right? So taper back a little bit. Not, 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 no one's thinking about you that much. Okay? You're thinking about you that much. Okay? That was a word for some. I'm going to leave it there. Drop it like it's hot. Okay? Let's move on. <laughs> who you fear is who you'll follow. And I'm not talking about like, you know, afraid, I'm afraid of the Lord. Oh, my God. You know, I'm, we're talking about what, what you're concerned with the most is who you'll follow. So if we actually stand before God and we're going, hey, I, I know that God approves of me, that God himself validates me, that God loves me. If I know the truth that God validates me, I do not live for your validation. I will not bend and I will not bow to get approval from you because my God approves of me. Come on, that's a word for somebody here tonight. Your God approves of you. He validates you. He loves you. Stop living for the love, approval, and validation of everyone around you that doesn't actually love you like Jesus loves you. Stop fearing man. Stop fearing man. Fear God. Because when we fear God, we obey him. And when we obey him, we advance the gospel. When the gospel is advanced, this generation can actually be transformed. I believe it. Am I the only one? Come on. I believe it. If we're here in this hour, this time, this moment, I believe we're here for a reason, for a purpose, to be the ambassadors in the hands and feet of Jesus Christ to this generation that desperately needs to know God and his love. Come on, somebody. So stop messing around with your purpose and the call on your life to share your faith. We can't be bottled up and paralyzed by fear. Number, number three is this. Let your life acknowledge Jesus. Let your life acknowledge Jesus. Let your life acknowledge Jesus. Matthew 10, 31 through 33, it says, fear not. Someone say, fear not. Therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Thank you, Jesus. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who's in heaven. Yo, this is so powerful. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Look at me. That's sobering right there. I read this in preparation to preach it, and I am like, oh my, oh my goodness. I know Jesus meant what he said. He's going, hey, if you acknowledge me, I'm going to acknowledge you. But if you deny me, I will deny you to my father. And I think we can, well, before I go there, I remember we had this spontaneous baptism day at our church. Remember, remember the, like the spontaneous, the, the all-in baptisms outside and we had you know, a huge crowd of people who were like, hey, I, I want to be baptized. Like literally that day, we had shirts, shorts, and towels for them. And we're like passing out these shirts, shorts, and towels to anybody that's like, yeah, I, I'm saved. I want to be baptized. Hello. Like, let me, I haven't been baptized for a year. I'm, I'm not sure why I'm not. Let me just jump in the, in the pool, get baptized. Remember that? Well, we had this day, and, and I think we had like 30 people decide to be baptized, literally decide that day to be baptized. I think that's incredible, right? And, and I remember, like, the, and so my, my responsibility was to, like, really briefly interview these people to make sure they knew what they were doing, you know? Like, just give them an idea on why they're doing this. And so they're not, like, just getting dunked and just thinking, yeah, look at me, you know? And so my, my responsibility was just to briefly, like, hey, like, hey, like, oh, so amazing that you're going to be baptized. Like, tell me, tell me, like, why are you doing this today, you know? Just to make sure they knew what they were doing. And I, I got to this, this really amazing woman, but, but I got to her and I was like, Hey, like, you know, why have you decided to get baptized today? And she said, oh, you know, like, I just think it's, you know, the next step for me. She said, but, 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 I need you to know, and I want, you know, I want this, I want people to know, my faith is private. My, my faith is between me and God. You know, this is a private thing, so I'm doing this. I don't, I don't want people to know about my faith. It's very private to me very private to me. I don't want people knowing. And I looked at her, I was like, oh, I said something like, um, it's actually like the exact opposite thing of what being baptized means. 
Like it's literally the opposite of that. And I said, you, you don't understand why you're being baptized. Because to be baptized means to go public with your faith. And you're saying, I swear allegiance to Jesus and no other man, no other God, no other ruler, no other Lord. It's Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. And I want the world to know this. Therefore, I am getting baptized. So this woman, thank God she had a change of mind, I believe. Okay, I'm hoping she did. Okay, we had a good conversation. But I'm here to say this. Can I just say like, you can't be like this woman and say, my faith is private. My faith is between me and God and no one else. And Jesus would look to you and say, um, no, actually, no. Let your life acknowledge Jesus. Don't deny him. I know that seems so simple, like, man, that's, you know, not like, can you come up with kind of a cooler point or something? But honestly, just don't deny Jesus. And when you're utterly persuaded, faith, faith literally means this. Faith means to be utterly persuaded and convinced. So when we have faith, it means we are convinced of what we believe. When we, are, when we have faith in Jesus, we're convinced that he's Lord, he's Savior, he actually lived, died, was buried, rose again, ascended, we believe he lives. When we're utterly persuaded, that's faith, my friends, that's faith. And when we are persuaded, when we are convinced, can I tell you, we can't shut our mouths. You know, and, and God forgive me for moments and times when I missed an opportunity to make a phone call or to tell my story or to just share my faith in Jesus. Like, Lord, forgive us. And here's the deal. God forgives us. And I think we, we hear this scripture, we're like, man, so if we deny him, we're out of heaven forever. And that's not even what Jesus is saying. Because a few, a few maybe months later or less, well, actually, maybe, maybe a year or something, time has gone by. And Jesus would look at Peter and say, hey, you, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, what? No, no. And Jesus is like, no, you're going to deny me three times. And, and, and in Jesus' worst moments, he's bloodied, he's been punched, he's been beat, he's been mocked, he's been spit upon, he's been laughed at, he's been court-martialed. In this moment, a slave girl says, hey, Peter, aren't you the, wait, you're the guy that was with him. And he's like, no, no. And he denies Jesus. He's been with him for three years. He denies him three times. And it's just interesting because we make Peter to be a punching bag in the church. You know, how stupid is Peter, man, denying Christ? So, yeah, but we, we, we deny Christ in our lives often. Like, I'm not saying reject him. I'm saying we just, there's moments we miss and there's things we don't say. And there's, there's times. But what about Peter? And let me just summarize what happens. Peter feels the remorse, the shame, the pain of this. He, he obviously sees Jesus resurrected, sees the power of God through Jesus and his triumph and his victory of the resurrection. Peter would go on and he would um, be restored by Jesus. Jesus would ascend. And then there's this moment that happened. Are you guys with me? Are you following me? There's this moment that happened. They're in this upper room, 120 believers or so are in this upper room and they're praying and they're praying for the Holy Spirit to come because Jesus said, hey, the Holy Spirit's coming. The Holy Spirit's coming. And they're praying in this moment, the Holy Spirit is, falls upon all the believers. He comes upon them in power. And Jesus said, hey, you're gonna be given power. That's not your own to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You're gonna be witnesses of Jesus, of me. And so Peter has this moment where the Holy Spirit falls on him. He steps up on a platform in this upper room. There's thousands of people in this moment who are listening in and peering in. And Jesus is there and Peter is there. And he preaches a phenomenal sermon. And he's, he's as bold as you can be. He's like, hey, guys, you killed Jesus. Come on, that takes like some courage to say, hey, you guys killed him. Because of your sin, he hung on the cross. 
but repent, believe. The kingdom is here. Believe in Jesus. And he preaches this sermon. And in and, and that one moment, 3,000 people are saved and baptized. Wait a second. What happened from Peter denying Jesus to then him going and preaching sermons and literally penning scripture as we know it? What the heck? What happened? He had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. 